Well, you know, I believe in there's a lot of people that are sitting on their hands at the moment, not saying anything, and they're, they're good speakers. You know, you know, they come and talk to you and sit behind over a coffee and chat away and come up with really good stuff, but go and say it. But you might as well be dead if you don't speak out. And a huge warm welcome to the Bar Stewards Inquiry Sunday Sermon. Uh, my name is Lee Keith of SystemBet.co.uk, and joining me as always is John Lang of uh, John Joe's Blogspot, and uh, the two of us who normally chew the fat uh, by ourselves and the odd uh, random guests on a Sunday are joined by a very special guest today, uh, Gay Kellaway. Welcome, Gay. Hi, I don't know about the special bit, but it's nice to talk to you guys, John and Lee. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, uh, yeah. I'm, morning, yeah. And I mean, I, I mean, Gay's probably not one for, for massive fanfare intros, but I mean, to some of our listeners that aren't uh, au fait with, with, with Gay as, as a person in her life, she was the first uh, female jockey to ride a Royal Ascot winner in Sprouston Boy um, in the Queen Alexandra. And and she she was a very successful rider, a stint in New Zealand. Uh, she was very successful over here in a very male-dominated sport at the time. And she went on to be a, become a very successful trainer. Horses like like Live Eat and Lad, uh, Vortex, who was my favourite, won the Group Three Criterion, and even Gay took it over to the uh, to the Arabs, the juiced up Arabs at Nadal Sheba, and she managed to win a handicap there off a mark of 105 with Vortex Gay. And currently Cosmele, that's more recent. That's the horse that beat You Can Glen in the 2018 Northumberland Plate Vars. So Gay. Um, How's life with you at the moment in, in in training life? It's great. I mean, don't forget lights, camera, action that won the um, 150 grand. That's probably my biggest race, and uh, uh, on the all weather. Um, blame the, I'm blaming the researchers. <laughs> <laughs> he won. He, he won a Good Friday, so that was a great. That was one of my biggest thrills. As yeah. was my most recent winner, which is my biggest winner, was a Group Two in 2019 with uh, Global Spectrum. That's right, sure. global global spectrum. Um, yeah. Did he? He's gone on to race in Hong Kong. I he's racing in Hong Kong for the owner. But my best horse, believe it or not, who I ever trained, I, and I was a young trainer then. And regrettably, I listened to the jockey Ray Cochran, and I should have listened to my own uh, ambition. And I think he would have won the Irish Guineas. He was a very good horse. He was 121 rated, third in St James's Palace um, Group One, and he was an extremely good horse. Horse called uh, uh, Soviet um, Sorby Tower, sorry, by Soviet Lad. Sorby Tower, he was a, he was probably the best horse I've ever trained. He was an aeroplane. You know, always know, it's funny, you get yearlings and young horses and you get on them and you, you, they're just average and you build them up to be better horses and you make them better horses. But this horse, you know, this is what uh, the likes of John Gosden and Roger Ver and all these big trainers must have horses like this all the time. But you get on them and they just feel like getting in a Ferrari rather than yeah. the usual mini, you know, yeah. amazing. So um, he would probably be the best horse I've ever had, will ever have. In yeah. my training career, at Sorby Tower. So yeah, do, do just you, for the record. <laughs> yeah, just 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 one one question for me. As a, as a trainer, do, do you still enjoy riding out to this day? Yeah, I did. I went through a bad time during COVID. I had a, a meniscus tear of the knee, a horizontal tear of the knee, which was uh, incurred from driving and riding mm. all these years. You know, I um, mean, I've been riding ever since I was. I mean, I rode ponies, but ever since I was. Uh, professionally uh, you know riding out and riding in race from 16 years old you know and I never really had a break I worked sort of um, a year in London but I was still riding out at weekends and I gave yeah. up riding but to be fair I'm just constantly riding and driving at just my knees went so I was out for six months without getting on a horse I was crippled but fortunately with a bit of help from med- medication and an exercise I'm, I'm back on three horses a morning and I absolutely love it passionate about it I love riding them. Um, I just want to get on a good one. I hope I, I might have bought a good one this year with yearlings. I bought a lot of yearlings this year. I had a bit of a clear out. So, um, yeah. yeah. Because and of the handicap system in this country, you just you get to a certain level with a horse and that's it, sadly. And you need yeah. to sell them or retire them because the handicap system isn't a fair system in this country. I think they um, crucify small trainers um, because we're trying our best and doing the best we can and, you know, I had a horse, for instance, you work this one out. I got a horse from another trainer. He'd run twice. He finished, only ever beat one horse in the two runs, two-year-old. And the guy had spent £2,000, the owner, to run him in the Doncaster sales race because he was qualified through 
a sales race. Yeah. So he said, Gay, well, I've paid the money. I want to run. And there's a day out at Doncaster, the, the ledger meeting. I said, sure, no problem. I'll run him. I said, he don't go too bad. He win a little Mickey Mouse race if we're lucky. Anyway, he finished 14th of 20, and they put him up £24. Jesus. Yeah. That, I, uh, and do you know where that horse is running now? He'll probably run tomorrow, and then he goes to the sales. The owner says, I see no point in keeping a horse like this. We ran him again at the all weather. He finished out the back door, and they dropped him five. They should have dropped him 20. Because yeah. the, the, if anything, they were going to put him up, they should have put him up four pounds. But it was absolutely beyond ridiculous. I still can't get my head around it. As I never can with a handicap. And I have this constant argument with them every year. They don't it's, see it. They, it's they, a to- they, it's a they topic. Such a, quickly put them up and so slow it put them down. It will cost you. And it costs trainers like, you know, it's all right. These rich trainers that can take horses all over the country and let them run down the back. And it will cost the owner about two thousand pounds with the traveling expenses, et cetera. Probably more with the training. And yeah, great. We've ran the horse four times. Um, there was a horse recently, a two-year-old of George Bowley's. They cut him, and and um, he's won like four or five straight races now. But they'd had to run him four times all over the country, so he's, he has a decent handicap mark to start with. But you know, you you invite an owner into your stable and say, look, if we're not going to be a group horse or a listed class, we have to get this horse handicapped, and we'll probably run him. And he probably won't do any good because he's backward and weak, but it's going to cost you another two and a half thousand pounds to get to be even capable of winning a race. And what yeah, do we yeah. win prize money? So, I mean, this this is the killer with training horses. And that's why I've had to have a massive clear out and sell a lot of my horses or find them nice homes because I get to a certain level with them. I can't win any more races, you know, yeah. unless they know what to go day out. For, it's, 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 money, you know? it's a it's a it's a very pertinent point you make and and it's a topic that's close to my heart handicapping because you see it a, a lot in jump racing as well where you you can you can bolt up um in, in a handicap chase a very weak one it could be yeah. four or five runners yeah. you know you could win 15 lengths handicapper puts you up 12 to 14 pounds yeah. beyond and, ridiculous and then beyond all of a sudden they're trying to then win beat the irish at cheltenham it, yeah. it's 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 in, it's an impossible, and this is where handicappers need to get a grasp of of handicapping. And I don't think I don't think the people they employ are skilled enough no. to, act, to actually. I hundred percent agree with you. And I Stuart Williams, who's a very very good trainer, we all know him well. Yeah, very he's, good a, he's a he's a bar stewards follower. Is Stuart Williams? Yeah, but I'll tell you something. Stuart said to me, and he's absolutely right. We we should computerize handicapping. It shouldn't be a human person a human being handicapping horses it should be computerized and therefore if it's done through a computer system i'm not clever enough to work that one out how to do it but mm-hmm. it's done through a computer system they realize no way my horse would have been put up 24 pounds yeah you only have to look at his form <laughs> he's rubbish the horse you know yeah he's I mean, moderate the- he's a he's a 55 horse I mean, this is what this is. That much. This is where handicappers are really poor, and there's, uh, yeah. I've seen many examples over jumps. For example, a horse could sort of make four or five mistakes, finish second, yet the handicapper will believe that that's the benchmark of the race, and that horse has ran to form, and then hammers the winner because. But but the one that finished second probably made four or five mistakes and probably didn't run within a, a stone of its best form. Yes, they failed to spot that, and yes. and that that for me is that's the poor the really poor bit of, of handicapping where you need to think, well, the second horse has run a stone below form, which means all the, all the winners had to do is run, run to his mark and shouldn't go up that much. Maybe just put him up a little too. I mean, I've lost count of the amount of races where I'm handicapping them after a race, say what they've run to. And I'm actually giving the winner less than its official mark. Absolutely. I mean, you only have to look, I mean, my argument is this, you look at William Haggis's and, Roger Vera and all these big trainers, these lightly raced horses, are so well handicapped. I mean, Sir Mars Prescott is a prime example. He he utilises the system, but it costs owners fortunes to do the way he does and goes up to Timbuktu to run them out the back door. Yeah. I mean, if you can't see that, any idiot can see that. You know, any idiot can see what, what's happening with some of these big trainers, but they don't care because all they want to do is win races. And they say it's clever. It's not clever. How much does it cost you, Sir Mark, to do what you do? Yeah. Going racing, paying expenses to your stable staff, uh, you know what I mean? And the transport and everything included and, and the training fees on top. It, they don't give you a chance to win races. I'm all for putting extra races on. But for God's sake, give us all a chance. And you only have to look at the 
the lower end races, how many, the, the bigger, the bigger the fields, because these big trainers will not run horses in these conditions races or these higher rated end races, novices against a 96 rated horse. They won't yeah. run because they don't want to get a bad handicap mark. So the other day, prime example was a, 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 a Yarmouth the other day. What's it? Six runner field. Look at all the trainers that finished behind that good thing of Jim, Jim Crowley's hand dance horse. Yeah. I think it was a, I can't, but I, I, I'm not sure if it was a Roger Varian horse, but it won on the bridle. And Martin Smith, small trainer, finished second. Be it they was five, six lengths. What's the handicapper going to do to him? Crucify him. Yep. He's it, struggling it'll be... to win a race. But yeah. they filled the field. They filled the field. The small trainers filled the field because their owners want to go racing. So they've run in this maiden. They're all small trainers. Christine Dunner, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 Martin Smith and all small trainers behind this good horse. Yeah. They're going to be crucified. Do you know what they should do? They shouldn't run. And then just have one horse races, you know, walkovers. Because yeah. that's what they should do. I mean, I, I wouldn't have run my horse against it. I can't. You know. I agree that the skill for you, Gay, is basically fat. So let's say an owner brings uh, buys your horse and, and uh, to train and you you know from from work on this horse this horse can run to about 70 so you think yeah. you, you say to the owner yeah, we're going to need to get a mark of about 60 um you know to make sure we can you know probably win a win a race so so you, you plan your races and that's the skill you 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 don't want to be in a race where there's a 95 rated uh, maiden or, or or a potential 90 horse in a maiden because like you say you could you could run a lovely race the owner's thrilled with the second place or the or the yeah. third place and then you see the handicap mark on the Tuesday uh, and it's yeah and it, can it, I just it, stop you right there right so you finish second or third to a good horse and then you thought oh god he's run too well so the next two runs you run it probably just run it you know in in a big field and it finishes out the back twice do you know what they do the handicapper they take the first run. They won't look at the first, last two runs. They take the first run and handicap you on that because yeah. that's how stupid they are. And that's yeah. how they kill small trainers and kill my business that way. You know? Yeah. And like you say, basically, you... handicappers, all they want and the BHA, all they want. And I'm a great believer in this. And I says, oh, you know, I say how it is. I, I think they only want big trainers. I, they, uh, and it's going to make their life a lot easier. They don't want to see people like Derek Shaw, Gay Kellaway, Julia Fielding, you know, all these smaller trainers, uh, you know, um, Michael Atwater um, and, uh, you know, I, I can, I know dozens of, you know, Rob Millman and people like that. You know, all these smaller trainers that come to me and they do, we're all sing off the same hymn sheet. Yeah. You know, they, they don't want us here. My dad said years ago, they don't want small trainers. They just want the big trainers like the John Gosdens, the Roger Varians, the William Haggises, you know, the Richard Fahis. So they're just dealing with, what, 40 trainers in the country. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> Is that what we want racing to go like? But they um, make us like this with the handicap system we have in this country. You know, in France, they basically just handicap the winner. You've got more chances in France. And do you know what? We don't have to wait a week. Do you know what? We have to wait. If you run on the Monday to the Saturday, OK, you get handicapped on the Tuesday. In France, you get handicapped the next, virtually the next day. So yeah. You can kick on and, and, and enter your horses. Uh, but if you run on the Sunday, you have to wait another week. You have to wait two extra more. Uh, no, another week over on that. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Ludicrous. Which brings us nicely on to our first sort of to talking point. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ranting on a bit. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It, it, it just brings us right on to the uh, subject. of uh, uh, When we say big trainers and small trainers, and I think this is a prime example, um, John Gosden in the news for the, the sort of wrong reasons this week, and obviously um, the poor stable lad carrying the can for the old uh, uh, ketamine found um, uh, in uh, in a sample of one of his horses last year, Franconia. Um John, I know you've got an interesting take on John Costin. Well, I've heard about Gay's legendary house parties. I mean, the Christmas party at Gosden's must be something to behold, really. <laughs> I mean, you, you've got Frankie and Benoit bringing out a stone of Charlie. The bro groom brings the cat, and Av Avlin will bring some camel tranquilizer in case Rachel doesn't fancy being passed around like a spliff at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he actually... I think, um... I think we have a problem with drugs big time in, 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 you know, we're meant to be so high up on horse racing and, and what have you. But I really think we don't look at stable staff enough. You know, yeah. uh, we're patting their backs all the time. There's really good lads in racing, but we have a massive problem 
with drugs in racing. I couldn't believe it yet. Um, then we I... have a massive problem. I can speak as I find. Yeah. I speak personally as well. What yeah. I've seen, people coming into my yard. I've got noses everywhere. If you under the influence, you you, you know you'd be asked to leave immediately. And I cannot have stable staff that are on drugs. Mm-hmm. And and and, yeah. and John Ross yeah. actually took yeah. a lad on yeah. that everybody's got rid of a new market who is well known for taking drugs and doesn't turn up in the morning. But yeah. it's got to the stage. Because they have a mass amount of horses, it's bums on seat. It's definitely bums on seat. You need to get the horses out. You with me? So they yeah. take anybody on. But I personally wouldn't employ a lad, and I won't do that now. You know, and I've had lads that I'm not aware of was was taking um, some sort of um, uh, recreational drug, and and they don't come in the morning. You know what it's like. You know anybody that takes that stuff, they don't. They can't. You know, I'm I'm ma- I'm anti drugs big time. Yeah. Uh, anti anti people taking drugs anyway and and it's a, it's very apparent in any walks of life whether it be in racing but you know you just don't employ people like that you can't employ you can't afford to employ people it's dangerous you it's a dangerous job riding horses every morning if you're not fully calm you you shouldn't be you should be working in racing you should be stacking shelves at tesco's or something you shouldn't employ people like that we should no. be a lot stricter of, of what who we employ what i couldn't believe about the story as well i mean Goes to the temerity to criticise the media, well, BBC mainly, for being negative about the story. Now, I've, I've wrecked my brains. The, the only positive I could find in that story is that he pays his staff enough to have a recreational drug habit. The big <laughs> issue, I should... mean, I don't know the situation, but, you know, we're trying to paint a good picture about racing, but it doesn't come across too well with the Ocean Murphy business and oh. the stable staff business, and we're no. trying to paint a good... And to me, I mean, my partner's not in racing, but doesn't view racing very highly. Well, right. very professional and it's very unprofessional in a lot of ways you know and i think we need to be a lot stricter when it comes to human beings riding horses every morning and riding in races you don't see an olympic athlete um take uh, drugs before a big event you know <laughs> because they're totally focused and totally dedicated you don't see them go out on the drink the night before do you no. they've got a lot stricter in football which i'm a great believer in the football you know I, I i mean you know i go to a lot of football and i understand the football players have gone up but i think they they are athletes they are finely tuned athletes and so are jockeys you know and i, I mean, think it's so important we're doing it we're doing basically a physical job every morning and you've got to be alert and you've got to be awake and you you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, I'm totally anti-drugs anyway, so don't get me on it. And I don't know the situation with John Gosden. It is hard when you're a big stable when you've got to employ a lot of staff. And you yeah. can't, you know, I mean, the buck stops at the trainer at the end of the day. If anything goes wrong, yeah, you can't overlook everything. You've got people that work for you and you trust them, et cetera, in, like in any big businesses. But, you know, it's just one of those things. But it does. it's a regular occurrence in horse racing. That's all I can say. Gay, what Gay, what would be your stance um, regarding drugs also uh, given to horses? I, you know, you, you've you've heard about the worldwide problems. You've you've had Bob. Baffert. I don't believe. I'll be honest with you. I don't believe. Um, I think it's very good that, that we do. Um, it's like France. We we do uh, police it very well. Yeah. I think we're very strict. The BHA are on the ball. Um, anything, you know, you're not allowed to give anything. And we've all been caught foul of it. You know, I mean, I personally don't give horses any, you know, I wouldn't anyway think about it. Yeah. But we do give them electrolytes. We've been caught out and we're not allowed to do that, which I couldn't never understand. We're not allowed. To, but they're so paranoid about you giving any horses on race days. And it's very strict. And I don't think any trainer deliberately does it. There's no skullduggery. I don't yeah. think I think we're I think uh, English trained British trainers are pretty on the ball. I, 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 what goes on in America is horrendous. We all hear about it. And even top trainers do it. I think in England we've got the cleanest sport and France. They're very even stricter in France. I yeah. think we have the cleanest cleanest when it comes to racing. Um, I really about, do. I do believe that. I mean, we have the vets are very meticulous and very strict, and they work with the jockey club. So no veterinary. Uh, well, I know the big companies like Rostells and uh, McKeeve, and they, they, I really believe that they are very, very strict when it yeah. comes to giving horses anything. What, you know? what's, your, what's your views on the Irish? Obviously, we've had the Charles Byrne escapade. We, we, we've had we've had. Things oh, like- the, don't get me on the Irish. You'll be here forever. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, mean, I do believe in this country it's very clean. I, I yeah. do believe, and 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 John Gosden, for God's sake, he's got enough good horses. He wouldn't deliberately do something like that, you know. He, yeah. you know what I mean? It just wouldn't happen. I know 
you know, John is very strict about stuff like that. So, you know, but you can't help things sometimes slipping through the net. You know, if the lad had been taking drugs, whatever, you know, he can't police him, the lad personally himself. You know, you've got a lot of staff. But we have this massive problem with stable staff taking drugs, as a lot of a, a lot of businesses have. You know, this mm. is and this is a, the, the God's honest truth. And it, it's really sad. You know, we disappoint you with the BHA reaction to the that case then, yeah, with, with Gosden, because I, I felt they should have been all over I this. Think people argue that, you know, he's been treated leniently and with smaller trainers would be key. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit unbalanced, you know, it's a bit unfair. It's rules for one, rules for the other. This is what I hear from other trainers, you know. Um, unless I actually know the facts, I can't really comment, you know, because no. um, all I know when it comes to horses, we have the cleanest sport. In, in, in horse racing you know in this country I really do believe that and I've seen it all over the world um, and I can you know mention some Middle Eastern countries you're not on a level playing field there you know <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we do really well for the English horses to go the European horses to go over to to race abroad in the Middle East and and, and win races because they are they are playing fair and we, we are playing fair in Europe and, and there's not so much I'm afraid I know that for a fact, but um, well, 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 you did it with Vortex. You you, you took them on. Oh. Yeah, I took them on, and he 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 never he never had any medication. He was just a naturally he had just had good feed, very good feed, and yeah. well looked after, and that's the key. And it's sad if you have to give horses medication because long term it, it's like a, you know an athlete would tell you if they take any kind of medication long term it doesn't work, <laughs> you know, yeah. because you have ill effects like injuries and stuff, you know. Yeah, detrimental longer term. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just one other thing reg- uh, regarding the Irish. Um, th- there was a recent uh, uproar uh, regarding the Irish not able to run their uh, sort of class six horses uh, or class five races and below in the UK. I think I think the BHA brought it into uh, because of COVID rules. Now, I've always been against the Irish bringing low class horses over here because we, obviously... Go on, say yeah. it, because they cheat and get the handicap marked. <laughs> of course yeah. they do. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, how many times have we seen them bring horses over and have it a massive bet and gamble? And there's poor little trainers like Derek Shaw, <laughs> myself, and um, David Evans, and, you know, and John Butler, and people like, we're all trying our best, and we're against a horse that's probably been the best handicap horse of the century, you know? Yeah, yeah, Backed off it, the board. It, yeah, I not... 100% agree with the BHA doing that. 100%. Yeah, I, I would certainly restrict them because, as I said, they're not coming over for the prize money. I mean, because with the ferry, with the ferry costs, the diesel, et cetera, et cetera, it's not worthwhile coming no. to win a, a race. They're coming to have a gamble and making oh, us yeah. look stupid. Yeah, <laughs> basically, pretty, it is, pretty isn't it? much. Yeah, it's the crack. Yeah. I mean, for them, it's the crack. But as I said, I don't think it's very fair on the small trainer like yourself that's finished yeah. second second last time out you're going for a race and you think oh we, we can win this next yeah, race now exactly. and all of, us, all of a sudden you see a random Irish trainer one formerly rated 72 now a 45 and you're thinking <laughs> you know well we know what that's that's there for um so like you say it's very frustrating right we'll, we'll move on to to our next topic um which um is the Brownie Frost and um Stopper Dunn, um, as, as, as he's, uh, there's a horse called the Stopper Dunn, and I'm sure it's named after Robbie Dunn, but anyway, that's for another show. Um, and obviously, Bryony was very upset at the comments made by Robbie Dunn during the race uh, or after the race, just after the line and, and, and in the in the weighing room afterwards towards Bryony. She felt very threatened, so th- threatened so much that she had to go to the press, she felt, to basically get her, her story out there. Now, Speaking to you, Gay, you yourself um, have, have basically came came through the sport in a very male-dominated era, and you yourself, um, you know, uh, reached out to the Daily Mirror back in 2017 um, with comments that uh, that you, that you uh, have suffered uh, during your time in the sport. Um, what's your view? What's your take on the the Briony Frost uh, Robbie Dunn situation? Well, I know Bryony and she must have been really bullied to actually come out like this because she would keep us a lot of stuff to herself. But I, what I believe, I, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it all, but, you know, you talk to other guys. I mean, I was at Cheltenham yesterday and I was chatting to a few, you know, jumping people that know a little bit more than I would. Yeah. And I felt that 
what I got, what I was led to to believe that this guy has been having a bit of a dig of a dig at her for quite a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he did what he did, said to her was quite, you know, quite threatening. You know, and you're riding racehorses, and it's dangerous sport, and you don't need someone to t- turn around and tell you, you know, whatever they're going to do to you. You know what I mean? You just don't need it, and it's it's a hard enough stressful sport enough as it is, and you're being professional. And I just think. If she was a man, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. That's what I believe. And for the jo- BHA, to say, you know, I don't know whether it's the jockey's thing that we keep everything, what goes on in the way and stays in the way, which is total, you know what? Yeah. Because I do believe there is, that you know, there has been, not so much now, but I think there has been some bullying from the senior jockeys to the younger jockeys, because probably some of the senior jockeys have passed their sell-by date and you get this young, good rider come along and, knocking people out the way and having a cut, you know what I mean? They kind of, I'd seen it myself, pick on them, you yeah. know, as it did with me when I was a, when I was a girl, you know, I'm even Willie Carson will tell you now, you know, oh, you know, Pat, Pat didn't want, uh, uh, Pat didn't want to be second to, to the girl because um, it made him look an idiot. Pat Edry that was. So yeah. Willie was second, you know what I mean? He, he took the mickey out of each other, you know, and that's what went on. And I had, I must have um, rhino, uh, had my skin like a rhino because I, I, I was extremely bullied. Um, I was um, physically pushed, pushed around and, um, and harassed. Um, and it was very, very tough. And I couldn't turn to anyone. But at least Bryony can turn to someone. Um, she, she got herself heard. And I think it was great. I mean... How they're handling it, I do not know. But I think it's quite a serious accusation uh, from Bryony because it must be serious because I know her. She wouldn't kick up a fuss. And so it must be quite serious. And I think we have to deal it accordingly because we shouldn't have any sport bullying going on. We're trying to fight that, aren't we? Discrimination, yeah. bullying. <laughs> you know, in this day and age, it shouldn't be happening. Do you, do you think the? I mean, I, I I always try and look at both sides of the coin in every every single uh, debate and you know and topic. And and do you think though that could have could have some of it could have been adrenaline fueled because of you know oh, in a race. Yeah, race, time. But I think you know. I do believe he's been picking on her for a while. Right, because and obviously something you, happened yeah. and it just yeah. it got, you know it must be bad for Bryony to kick off. That's all I can say because I know all the jockeys, all the women jockeys, they keep stump. If anything happens, yeah. you know. But do you, do you think this leak was in any way deliberate? You know, like the government sort of allow things to be leaked in <laughs> advance of them doing something fairly soporific and yeah. not actually. We couldn't get any diesel, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was leaked, but it was. I think it was important. I think it's important when lives are at risk, you know, and you got the mental health thing, you know. Um, and I, I just think that the, the, the BHA have allowed this leak because deep down they don't intend to do an awful lot about changing this culture. I yeah. think, look, I'll be fair to the BHA. They came to see me and mm. I didn't give names because it, to me it's water under the bridge. Nobody raped me, thank God. Um, and I think, but I think I just wanted to get out there because I heard a girl was getting bullied by a trainer. Or been harassed by a trainer yeah. in this modern day, which shouldn't be going on, in, in, you know, a, a, an apprentice. And I, I, I got it out there. I said, yeah, it does go on. I want people to be aware it did go on. In my time, it was horrendous. Um, yeah. And, you know, and then I got a lot of phone calls from various girls in racing that said this happened to them, but they don't want to come. They're too frightened to come out and speak yeah. up. Yeah. You know, it's the the same business in the um, the movie world, you know, but people don't actually come out. But, you know, and I think if people are aware of it, a lot a lot of people will think twice of, of bullying. You know what I mean? I mean, I yeah. think it's got to be, you've got to have it out there and everybody be aware there'll be serious consequences if you bully or if you harass someone. I think it's got to be apparent and being aware. I think if we, we, we make it, you know, we bang our drum loud enough, I, I think we'll stop all this nonsense, you know? Is there a hard and sharp whistleblowing policy then, yeah? Or a, 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 well, I think, like I said, you know, what goes on the weighing room stays in the weighing room, um, which I think is wrong. Yes, I do. I, I think, think there should be problem. There should be policed. I think a BHA and the, the quick run, rushing around the stables keeping an eye on us lot, 
I think they should want to keep a little bit of a sharper eye on what goes on in the weighing room. And another thing I don't approve of, and in my day, I wasn't allowed near the weighing room, girls. No. I, was one. I wasn't allowed to go in the men's changing room at all. But you see it all the time, the girls going in the men's changing room and da 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 It shouldn't be allowed no. mixing like no. that, you know. It should be separated because, you know, um, you know, really strict. But I think there should be a, 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 I think there should be a, a, whether there is, there might be someone from the BHA that keeps an eye on what goes on the weighing room. I don't know. But I think well, well, the last thing you want to see, Gay, if, 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 if like you say in in a, in a in a male changing room, is 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 the last turkey in the butchers uh, swinging around after a bad day at the office for yourself. I mean, like you say, it, it, that 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 can't be right, surely. No, and they do, and I've I've never agreed with that. I mean, I I remember my day in the eighties. I wasn't allowed near the weighing room, the boys' changing room. Mm. I'm not allowed. You know what I mean? Um, mm. But now I see the girls go in and out there and. You know, they mix all together. And I think that's wrong. I really do. You know, and I didn't, obviously, I didn't have changing rooms, but they do have separate changing room facilities. So I need to go in there. I know they've got the valets. Maybe the girls should have separate valets to the men. I don't know. Should be women valets. I've never seen a woman valet ever. No. Why don't we have women? We're meant to be equal opportunities. You know, yeah. there's not a woman valet there. So, yeah, that's something to, to, to look into, you know, to look further on. I think, believe that should be brought in. Yeah, and it, and another worrying thing, and again, this this is typical of, of British racing as I see it, that since Briney, um, you know, uh, made these allegations, et cetera, and it became public, and especially recently, um, she's not really picking up many rides. And that kind of worries me. Because there are certain trainers that support her, Neil King, Paul Nichols, um, uh, Lucy Wadham, I think, uh, as, as supported her. Um, but, but, Outside of those, she's getting very few outside rides. Now, is that racing being insular and, and being against Bryony, or, or am I reading too much into that at the moment? I think you might be reading too much into it. You know, I think – I don't think so. I, I wouldn't mm. – I mean, I love Bryony. I'm, I'd use her all the time, you know. I think she's a great, great rider. She's yeah. great for racing, you know. I just think it's like all jockeys, whether you're in favour, someone's in favour. So I think that jump racing is a tough game. It's very, very tough game. You know, yeah. I, I admire any girl rider that gets involved in, in, in riding over over jumps. I think flat racing is a lot easier than jumping. Absolutely. I mean, Brainy has, has, has proven herself no end uh, in my eyes. I think she's a, a terrific, terrific uh, horse, horse per, person. I, I have to be careful in my speech these days. Horse person, horse woman, I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, she, she's, she, she knows the horses. I think horsemen is regarded as women as well. Is it? Is it right? Yeah. Well, you've I mean, got women, men, and yeah. men. Yeah. <laughs> you know I, mean? I, I, I get so confused with what what you can and can't say these days. But but yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope I hope this this. Sort well, of, she's a natural horse person, you know. She's natural. Yeah. Um, you know, she you've got to be it. carefully using the term horseman because you might get confused with that Masonic cult that's supposed to be representing everybody in racing. <laughs> Well, you just say horse person because they're a person. You're not, you don't become not a person, do you? You don't know. Just call everybody a person. Well, I, I, can person. Remember Holly Do- I can remember Holly Doyle saying it. she was um, quite upset at the, at the term female. She, she just she wants to upset. be... upset. They used to call me a... What did they used to call me? Um, a, a woman <laughs> jockey or something. Like a joquette. <laughs> no, that's the word, joquette. I used to hate yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. I used to hate being called a joquette. I mean, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, a you know, woman riding uh, a, a a woman jockey. Yeah. No. Um, but uh, no, trust me, Holly. You want to be around when I was around? What they used to call I mean, me? Just jockeys, aren't you? You know. I mean, you, you know, they never say male. Yeah, but it is good for the public to know that a woman is riding because it is a big thing. Because yeah. no other sport, bar motor racing, that women compete on the same terms. You've got exactly. Yeah. Big tennis events, football, it's all separate and it's yeah. in their thing. You know what I mean? And and women tennis, as well, you know what I mean? You, you look at all sports, you know, it, it's all separate. You know, uh, uh, you know, a, a single um, single sporting event, you know, you have you don't see men and women racing against it on, on the track, track and field, do you? You know, no. so. Um, it is a big thing, yeah. And I think you've got to be aware there's a woman. I think it's very important in this world we live in that a woman is riding. And 
the percentage of women riding against men is still very small. Yeah. It might be one, maybe two girl riders in, in a race. And they do. And the same with training racehorses as well. There's still a minority in, in training racehorses. And you look at every woman trainer, how well they do. Yeah. Well, you know, compared I mean, to the guys. Th- three, three, three women. Sport, yeah, in my sport, in racing, for some reason, and, and you see, my perception is what is your, I'm asking both of you guys, what is your perception from a race goer of horse racing? What do you perceive? Well, I spoke to a lot of people, especially at the football the other day, and they said to me, well, it's the sport of kings, isn't it? You've got to be rich to do that. Yeah. And we should really get it out there, sport for the people. It's sport for everyone. You know, the kids can go, the wives can go, you know, everybody can go. I mean, Chelm was great. You know, at Cheltenham, there was a different type of people there compared to flat racing. It was great. And you know what the people were in, in, interested there? You didn't see anybody getting drunk or throwing themselves about. They were actually interested in the horse racing and they were passionate about it. And that's why I want to see more people going racing. They're going to be passionate about horse racing, not going there for the, the gigs, the, uh, the, the awful concerts that they have and all yeah. that. You know? well, well, that's what concerns me and John. That the the flat racing, especially in the summer, is going down the route of Oof, of, of attracting yeah, of attracting the wrong you wrong know, type of people. That's, yeah, that's that, why yeah. I thoroughly enjoy jump racing because you have the right type of people go there. And we're not talking snobbery here. Anybody, we want to, you know, make it the sport for the people, not the sport of kings. We've got to lose that tag in horse racing. We've got to somehow try and lose that tag in horse racing because that's the perception people have outside racing you've got to be rich to own a racehorse well you have yeah. to be really with the prize money but there you go but whereas in australia anybody the, the baker the candlestick maker the butcher can only share in a racehorse and it brings the people together it brings people together horse racing in in australia and so it should should do you know Absolutely. and that's what we've got to try and turn racing around that way so we can see racing as a a sport that for all it's a sport for all sport for anybody's go kids go you know, you go racing in Deauville in France, you got one, we haven't got like bars, tents and bars and beer drinking and all that Irish bars and all the rest of it. You've got down the bottom end, you've got picnics for families. Little kiddies can have a ride on ponies, you know, little pony rides and stuff like that. So it's all horse orientated, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, in, you know, a good day out. You've got to, you know, you've got to sort of market a really good day out horse racing. And it is a good day out. I mean, I'll go... When I haven't got runners, because I love horse racing. I love going, watching the horses, socialising, meeting friends. You know, it's great. Absolutely. Great Leaving comments. Money on horse. <laughs> great comments. And that, that, that's what we need more of. And I don't I don't want the tracks going down the route of, um, you know, marketing race days or some kind of, you know, gig I fest. I hate it. I yeah. hate it. Get on the grandstand at Lingfield on a Saturday night and they're all drunk and they're not even watching the races. No. Got hen parties, hen nights, bachelor day. You know, it's just, you know, it's just dreadful, dreadful. Yeah. Most Not, people are never going to return either. I mean, yeah. you, you know, I mean, they're just occasional race goers. You know yeah. what I mean? There's exactly. no plan to retain race goers yeah. at all. I mean, they brought in the Shergar Cup, but they did nothing to monitor how many converts that created to racing. Yeah, you know, they didn't offer discounted vouchers for the next meeting so they could actually see what the yeah. what the take up would be. Because every marketing initiative that they have is totally unquantifiable so they can have another awards dinner and pat each other on the back on the job well done. And nobody knows <laughs> yeah, who we got it everyone there. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it, John. Uh, which brings on then to, to our final topic uh, in, in this week. Uh, Arena Racing uh, tried to um, uh, persuade the uh, National Trainers Federation and um, the professional. I'm not a member, by the way. Not not of the, the only national. The thing I ever got out of the National Trainers Federation is lots of invoicing through my Weatherbiz account, and my Weatherbiz account is small enough as it is with the awful prize money we have. Absolutely. And uh, the only thing I ever got is a sandwich out of that place. And we didn't even get that through COVID. So um, you must so have done a nice brass I, brass brass. I found them no help at all to me um, through the years of 30 odd years of racing. I don't think I've ever used them for anything. And I felt they're pretty weak when it comes to um, banging the drum. Yeah. Uh, I know we're going to have a new leader next year, so I might view it differently. But um, as far as arena leisure, OK, great minds. Who else is going to sponsor? 
if they, you've got another sponsor out there, get them. But I think our sports racing are a hell of a lot and, 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 and holds us up quite a bit. They're a big rock and we need them. So why on earth are we knocking them and turning things down? I certainly agree from it. Like I see both sides of, the, of this, of this coin. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. Um, I, I see the point that, that this is valuable for some trainers to basically be able to get in races. We all know how difficult it is to get in the, the not the 55s, the, the, the not the sixties. It can be very difficult, you know, to, and they it, want to put more races on for us. Great. Yeah. So you know it's ex- exactly. I can't knock them. Please, you tell me, guys, who else is going to take the sponsorship? Who else is going to put five million in? But tell me, who else? What well, other sponsor will be on the side that's going to well, take over? Have we well got that, another massive company to come and take it over and do this for us? Well, that's the sad. That's the sad point. And that this is this is the other side of the debate where I'm I'm not saying I'm sided with Hugo Palmer because I do see both sides, but I do get the thing where. We've seen how ground racing's gone, and bookmakers have this uh, knack. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this summer, but they've changed the start times to 1 p.m. in the summer. That that was never the case for summer meetings. It was always 2 p.m. throughout most of the summer, but they've moved that to Oh, yeah, but I'm a great believer starting earlier because we have such a hard day, and we finish so late, and we've got to get up so early in the morning. So the earlier racing, I mean, I remember when we had the racing in the winter. Remember we had that um, banded racing? And it was yeah. on the TV and it was really good because people are, you know, and their office breaks, lunchtime, it was to go in there and let's have a bet on this one. You know, they had, we all had different coloured caps, I remember. And it was at Wolverhampton and Lingfield, this banded race. And it was particularly a betting race, wasn't it? And everybody was betting on it. I don't know why they did away with it. It was a low grade race and everybody, you know, it always a full field. And it was a, do you remember, do you remember that? Yeah, that I, race yeah, yeah. Early the, the, racing, I'm a great believer in that. I'm a great believer in that in France they have, um, they have a, like a 10 o'clock start virtually and then they stop in the afternoon and go again in the other, you know, the same racetrack. It's yeah. like 12 races or 14 races, whatever it is. So, you it's, know, it's, it's, um, and they want it for, for and they, they, they haven't got bookmakers, but they do it for the PMU because people get up in the morning, have their coffee, do their bets, etc. you know. Yeah. I mean, Hugo Palmer's concerns. I mean, obviously, Hugo Palmer. He's got no you? concern. He won't go hungry, would he? <laughs> huh? Exactly. Look, I wouldn't mind being a pound behind him, eh? <laughs> Uh, but I mean, he, he has got a point that that this happened to ground racing where they they wanted to put on so many meetings and yeah, the, it, it generated more betting revenue, which I suppose in the current levy deal is is what we want. But the the tracks sort of became ghost towns where they used to be thriving energetic um, kind of places to meet. Like you just highlighted, you know, race yeah. going racing is great. Are we in danger, Gate? Of- well, it will happen, won't we? Because we haven't got enough people going racing, I'm afraid. But no. big meetings will all be well supported. The Cheltenham, the Rascots, you know. And that's what we've got to really sort of cash in on the big meetings. There will be blank meetings during the week. I mean, at Savile on a wet day on a Wednesday in December, there's no one there, as there's not in Wolverhampton. And you're going to get that. It's exactly the same across the whole of the world. There's people don't go because don't people work? You know what I mean? Yeah. You have racing midweek, you know, you, unless you do away with certain days like Monday, which will never happen. But if you do away with a Monday racing, I'm quite happy to race all day Sunday and Saturday, but we need a rest day, you know, for, for me, for the staff, for the jockeys, everyone, you know, we need a rest day. Yeah. I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm for all for having Sunday racing if we have a rest day, because that's when people have days off. That's when they can go racing. I'm no, no unemployment, you know, you know, nobody wants to work. There's not unemployment anywhere. Nobody wants to work, do they? I mean, everybody's looking for people, whether it be in in in, in drivers or in, uh, uh, restaurants. Everybody's short staffed. Uh, dentists, even my dentists are short staffed. You know what I mean? Well, so it has to be quality of life for you all as well. I mean, I mean, this yeah. is the thing. You, you you're dedicated to these horses, and the thing is, you know, horses like the routine. You get it's up, not a you, job with us. It's it's a way of life. It's a way so of life. So anybody that comes into yeah. my life, you've got to understand this is my life. Yeah. This is, and it's a nice life. It's not a bad life working with horses. It's lovely. I work with animals. I get up every day. It's fresh air. It's healthy. You know, I'm not stuck in an office or I'm not stuck in a small building. You know, I'm outside every day. It's, it's a great way of life. It's a healthy life. It's a long life if you don't take drugs or drink yourself to death. You know, so, yeah. you know, it's a good life. It's a very, very good life. You you see, know, and, what I couldn't grasp about this turning down this money from ARC, I mean, you You've got the Horseman's Group, who were the one dissenting voice, apparently, that 
that scuppered this day, look on uh, Mr. Crudis. Well, they could have taken that money and just put a little rider on there where they said if the nine race cards didn't look like filling out, they would dispense with the races that had the horses, not enough horses declared. Exactly. But, I'm but, with you on this. Not races, but they could have agreed to the deal, taken yeah. the money with that yeah. rider applied, and there would have been no problem whatsoever. But nobody's thinking outside the box. All they're thinking about is not rocking the boat and keeping the sport elitist. Yeah, elitist. Again, our perception, sport of kings. Yeah. We've got to be like, fo- I go to football a lot, and it's fantastic. And, the, you know, I went to Chelsea, I'm a big Chelsea supporter. I went to the Chelsea game the other day against Malmo, and the stadium's full. In fact, they built built a bigger stadium. It'd be the capacity they take because people want to go to football. People enjoy it, and it's it's a it's a people's game. You know, people anybody can go. Everybody can have fun. You know what I mean? And that's how racing should be. But a lot of people say you've got to be rich to do that or go. You know, we just got to be more open, inviting for horse racing. You know, and and. We've got to be big on slogans and slow on action. That's that's the problem, you know. I mean, this Mr. Crudders, he, he referred to an interview that had taken place with John Gosden on telly, where the trainer spoke of the importance of the industry, not relying on government and instead carrying out self-help. But it, it, it was a typical Gosden speak, you know. I mean, he's going to end up president of the BHA or something when he finally hands over to Slim Thady, but that's another <laughs> matter. Um, but... He's not actually offering up anything to substance. He just says, well, we've got to help ourselves. Do you know right? what? It's all right listening to these big trainers, but why don't they pull a few smaller trainers out there? Of course they should. That that's, well that's, off in their own right. They own their own farms. They own their own stables. Yeah, I mean, the greatest spokesperson who's who's in the middle row is is Stuart Williams. And he was a stable lad. And yeah. he knows it's, he's ground rooted. And he comes up with some great ideas. But he's given up. He that's, said it just falls on deaf ears. Why do I speak? You know. Yeah, I said he's coming forward with ideas, not just issuing glib statements. You know, I mean, everything. They want to keep racing elitists. They want to keep racing elitists. It's yeah. a huge amount of snobbery in racing, and I can't sort of whether in my time, I don't think it would change. You know, um, it was growing up like it. It was a huge amount of snobbery. That's why women weren't accepted to be a rider uh, when I was riding. You know, too much snobbery. I mean, I remember when I first got into racing. There was one girl in our yard riding out. Now, the minority in riders are, in stables are girls. Yeah. Girls weren't, didn't even get a job. And I have a letter from um, the uh, the Jockeys Association, this girl writing for a job. Um, Nigel Tinkler gave it to me, actually. He said, um, I'd really like to get into racing, and how would I go about it? She says, and this this person from the, the Jockeys Association said, I suggest you find an alternative job. It's not for girls. I know times have changed, like I've been told by the stewards. When I give an yeah. apprentice a bollocking, he said, "Times have changed. You can't speak to people like that." But, but it was, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're 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 one of the pioneers. I mean, I mean, yourself, Alex Greaves. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Alex was quite a way after me, you know. Yeah, you know, exactly. Emma Gorman, and Alex Emerald Greaves, Gorman. You yeah. know, yeah, um, they all good. I mean, Emma will tell you a lot of stories. A lot of stories. Alex all the same. But they were way after me. I and mean, there was times during the, when I gave up racing, I mean, through the 90s, there was no one about. There was Alex, but that that was only for a short term. Emma for a bit. She I, couldn't, I, I, see, I, I, see, Alex and, and um, Emma could, didn't have, I thought, my dad said, oh, you're 10 t- years too soon. I was never 10 years. I was 30 years too soon. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, Alex did well. Emma did well. And there was a couple of other girls that did well, but they didn't yeah. continue like they do now. You know, yeah. and the reason why they continue now, and I said this time and time again, because these trainers that wouldn't even put me up back in the day or any girls back in there putting girls up now is because they need we need women in racing because they're the people, the main workforce now. Because guys yeah. aren't in it anymore. They're too heavy, they're too tall or whatever, or not interested. But it's now we need women in racing, therefore the trainer feels they have to give a girl a chance to ride in races to keep them. And that's why there's more girls. Yeah, it'd be great to see Holly as a champion jockey. I think it will happen. Yeah, I think so, because she's so dedicated. I mean, yeah. you know, he's so dedicated. Guys, I've got to love you and leave you. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, just, it's just been one, wonderful to talk to you both. One, fi- one final question. Um, yeah. Basically, um, the o- the Oshie McSweeney uh, 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 debacle. Uh, just, just, just comment what went on there. Was this was this adrenaline gay after the race or? Oh uh, well, do you want to? I'll give you the truth, right? Yeah. And I always give the truth, and I was truthful to the stewards. What happened was, it was a cold December night. I'd driven the horse box. None of my staff wanted to go racing. I said, fine, I'll take the horse myself. He's easy. A cold December night, I'd driven the horse box. I was leading the horse up, so I had no witnesses there. Um, the two particular jockeys have a grudge against me that reported me. I was no different than any other track. I had five or six phone calls on the Sunday afterwards saying, gay, we can't, we can't tell a jockey off anymore. For me, I was quite meek, but the lad had come up with two of these certain jockeys that won the race and were second. Um, and obviously the poor kid, they've obviously grilled him, you know, put him on the edge. So the kid's on the favourite, which is mine. And in a very small field, he's decided to come between those two jockeys who squeezed him up. Unknown to me that he had to go in the steward's room. But prior to that, I'd led the horse in. I said, you give that a real dot dot of a ride. I said, go back into the weighing room and watch that race. You should have won. They are my exact words. OK. Yeah. Not as calmly as this, obviously. So the, obviously the kid has gone back in the weighing room and he's got dragged in the steward room and those jockeys probably bullied him. And I can't prove it, but I reckon those jockeys said, this is what you get saying. And the kid's, bread, the kid's head's fried. I've given him a bollocking. Those jockeys are saying this, that and the other, you know, because they, they don't want to get days. Yeah. The, what, the winning jockey didn't even hear what I said. And he's gone into the gone into the stewards and said I said it, and he didn't even hear me because I was nowhere near him, unknown to me. So I didn't know all this was going on because I was doing the horse. But one of the jockeys that I wouldn't give rides to has got a grudge against me. I think it was Mullen, who can barely get a ride on Pancake Tuesday. So and <laughs> Mullen, and um, and he's obviously got a grudge against me. He's always put in a few comments over the winter season, you know, stupid yeah. comments, so which I ignored. So anyway, so. They've gone in and said, I, I, I bullied him. The kid didn't go in the weighing room. He never went in the, sorry, the steward's room. He didn't want to get involved, which fair do to him. He didn't want to get involved. But the kid was crying, apparently, because he had to go in the steward's room. It's all new to him and everything. And, you know, and he knew he probably should have won and blah, blah, blah. So he's pretty upset, as you would be. So the kid w- wouldn't go. In, and I was a bit slow. And I should have said, no, I didn't. I just give him a, you know. But the, I, I admitted it and I said to the steward, look, I hold my hand up. And, you know, I did give, have a go at him. He said, well, and it was just after the business with Paige and the other jockey had a go at each other. You know what I mean? And the Gordon Elliott business. So things were building up a bit. Even the stewards told me this, you know, we've got to do something. They were quite nice about it. But I just basically, it was two jockeys I grudge against me. But what I do object to, I held my hand up and paid the fine. Okay. But what I object to is the bullying that went on social media fr- from certain jockeys afterwards. Just yeah. wanted to get the knife in, you know. Jockeys that I don't use. So yeah. that's the only thing I do did, w- was very upset about, you know. Good stuff, Kay. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying that. And yeah. um, you could enjoy your Sunday lunch. And, thank um, you. Thank you I, very much. Thank you very much. Can I just say, so, as David Ellsworth would tell you and Stuart Williams people said, God, gay, I've given, I've battered some jockeys after. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But you got to remember, we have every right to tell them off because we are actually paying them to do a job. For you know? sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I have no problem with that. And I, I was, I, I cannot be regarded, and my staff will tell you, I'm not a bully. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that type of person. But I had a hard upbringing and I took a bollocking. And if you can't take a bollocking, you might as well get out of the game, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to enjoy your lunch and thank you very much for appearing. My pleasure. It's been, it's been, a, been a wonderful experience for us too. <laughs> and we'll speak again, no doubt. Very when, soon. Yeah, when, I've still got plenty yeah. more of you. So, you know, we'll, anytime. We'll, we'll definitely back on the show. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, John. Um, I mean, just, just to clarify the, uh, the, uh, the finishing of the show there, I, 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 I thought that was tremendous from Gay. Um, to come on and 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 you know discuss the topics uh, that, that that we put up, um, yeah, quite quite took a back by that. I, I, yeah, just some some really good points of view and certainly different to my own, which I like. I, we don't want echo chambers on this show. Um, your thoughts? I had, which is always good. I think you know. I mean, it's really right. refreshing to find somebody in racing who actually says what they think and offers up an alternative to the meandering claptrap that we get from the people at the top. 
I mean, I said to you this morning, I watched that Joey Harrington interview this morning with Nick Luck. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's the CEO of this sport. Well, we're in dire trouble if that if that's the best we've got to got to offer. Glib cliches and a marketing background. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, it does worry worry me some of the BHA appointments that are not really industry experienced and you know like i said every appointment they ever seem to make are just not really up to the up to the up, cut the mustard really and um, like 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 we talked about we gave about handicappers i have got this passion that that i would love to be head bha handicapper the simple reason i'm a professional punter um i could apply my skills um and i would stop betting if people said right you've got to stop betting to to do this as a job and you've got to be above board, none of this skullduggery yeah. business. I would do it, but I'd need a salary that's worthwhile, not the 50 yeah. grand a year. Oh, but, you know, that's no good. Um, you, you, you've, you've got to pay, pay, pay skilled people well to do a great job, and I would honestly make the sport miles better. I'd, I'd, I'd be able to clean it up. You know, none of this 33s into five to four, you know, on first time handicap winning by seven. I'd put them up 35, you know, yeah. because I'd just say, well, you just took the piss. So there you go. That that's, yeah. that You've had your day in the sun, but now you can <laughs> reap your rewards. Um, and, and and for the genuine trainers that, like like Gay said, you can get punished for just running a horse in a, in a big race, go up 20 odd pound for just trying your best and, you know, it's just ridiculous. Like you say, therein lies the crux of the problem. I mean, the Nick Luck interview with Jolie Arrington, well, like, like John and Jolie Arrington, it should have been David Brent from the office in female form, to be honest. Um, she, she, Nick Luck said, what, coming into the spot, the OC is racing's biggest problem. And she said, racing's biggest problem is shooting itself in the foot, not yeah. saying how great it is. I mean, Jesus Christ. If, if if she'd said that interview when I was on the panel, I'd have just shown her the door there and then. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, she needs a plan. She clearly hasn't got one. None of the previous C- CEOs have acted as though there's anything going on in the world outside of racing. No. They need to address the broader economic picture. I mean, they're all Tories, for Christ's sake, so they ought to be free market advocates. Now, strangely, when it comes to racing, their first thought is government intervention. Lots of people dip in and out. No stats, of course. You know, she said, oh, people dip in and out. We're, in this, we're competing for the leisure pound. No, never a mention of prize money. As Gay said, down the bottom end, it absolutely stinks. They need to do something about it. There's no intention of doing anything about it. No. We learn through trying things on Racing League. No mention of measuring its success or failure. They've got the Keep Owners in Racing Group. Now, they've criticised the BHA. You get glib nonsense from her about owners being at the heart of their decision making. That means jack shit, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing. He, he, talking about working with stakeholders again, it means jack shit. Plan for growth, not something we can do alone. We need to bring people together. Well, what do you do? You know, another cliche. There's no magic wand. Oh, send for Theresa May's scriptwriter. There's no magic money tree. She couldn't even identify an area of growth when Nick Luck asked her. Despite running a sport funded by betting, wouldn't you think, with a little bit of thought, she might have realised that growing the betting might grow the funding? No, she didn't identify that. So the background's in marketing, offering what people want to buy. Well, you're offering a sport funded by betting on it, love. So you need to increase that, not decrease it, with socks to the Gambling Commission and animal rights. Here, 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 here. Absolutely splendid rant from John. And I think that just about does it. Uh, We're back on Friday. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this show like me and John did. That was very refreshing. We're back on Friday. uh, Usual time, usual slot uh, for Weatherby Charles. (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're fit. Yeah, whether whether be Charlie all meeting and Ascot jump meeting just to please John. Uh, we're back on Friday. Panel to be decided. I've got to I've got to move some people about and do do. But me and John will be back. We're fit and firing. That's all from us. We hope you enjoy this gay Kelloway message. Special. I'll get my words out. Bye for now. Right, the show's over, boys. Thank you very much.